back when I was in grade school. My mother was chairman of the local school board. It wasn't much of a school, just three classrooms, grades eight through one, 60 kids in the school. My first grade teacher, also second and third grade teacher, would stop by at the house every now and then after school to talk things over with my mother. And one day they got onto the topic of religion. My teacher was Roman Catholic. And she said something that even when I was six years old sounded very strange. She said, well, if being Catholic doesn't make you better than other people, what good is it? You stop and think about it. That's what a lot of people do in this world. They do something because they think it makes them better than other people. And that whole mindset is a real trap. The idea that there are people who are better than others, or worse than others, or equal to others. Because it tends to swing back and forth between the extremes, either very high exaggerated self-esteem, or then self-hatred, back and forth, back and forth, because this idea of self, of who you are, becomes the big issue in life. And you do everything you can to shore it up. And then when you find yourself doing things that are not up to that high standard, then you feel really miserable. And it's good to remind yourself that all those issues are pretty useless. They don't accomplish anything at all. It's the, what Ajahn Mahabur calls the fangs of unawareness, the fangs of ignorance, this whole issue of conceit. So it's good to remember we're here meditating not because it makes us better than anybody else. Simply because we want to be happy, and we want to have a happiness that's worth the effort that goes into it. And we know that for our, eff our happiness to last, it means it has to be a happiness that doesn't harm anybody else. So we're compassionate to others, not because it makes us a better person. We're meditating not because it makes us a better person. We're trying to be good in our actions, not because it makes us a better person, but because it leads to true happiness. When you keep the issue close to the ground that way, then you don't have to go swinging back and forth between extremes of exaggerated self-esteem or exaggerated self-hatred. Think back on the forest tradition. It was started by sons of peasants in Northeast Thailand, which is the poorest part of the country. And one of the issues that John Munn found himself dealing with again and again was people feeling that they didn't have what it takes to really do the practice. And he kept reminding you, you've got a human body. And you've got a mind that doesn't want to suffer. That's all you really need. As to how well you're doing in the practice, you start where you are. This is one of the reasons why we have the recollection of the Sangha, to set our, our standards right. You look at all the people who've been practicing, they've been men, women, children, rich people, poor people, healthy people, sick people. And what do they have in common is that what they had in common was that they wanted true happiness. And they were willing to do what it takes. That's all you really need in the practice. And the question of whether this makes you better than anyone else, better than anyone else, that's not an issue. 
that issue of pride comes in when you when you do crazy things and then have to justify them to yourself. You know, all the rituals and rules that used to be a big part of religion and still are part of a lot of religions. And they make no sense at all. You know, people keep on doing them because they have that idea, well, it makes me better than other people. So fortunately, in the Buddhist teachings, we don't have many of those rules. There are some rules, but they make sense. You think of the Buddha himself when he was uh, on the path trying to find awakening. He spent all those six long years in, in austerities. And what can keep you going through six long years of austerities? Well, it's the idea that it's, you're better than other people. And so it kept him going for six years, even though he realized ultimately that it was the wrong path. It was his ability to realize that. That's what set him apart. But all those sacrifices he made were really for nothing. And when you can admit that to yourself, okay, that's that's when you learn humility. And so it's good to come to the practice with that attitude of humility. We've been making mistakes all along. But it's good to be able to admit the mistakes and to realize that, yes, the mind does need training. Okay, here's an opportunity to do it. A lot of my training with the John Fu consisted of his pointing out to me where my weak points were. He wasn't doing it all the time, but he did it at strategic times. He once made the comment about Westerners being very stubborn. I had to reflect on, well, how many Westerners had he ever met in his life? I think I was the only one. So that was the prime lesson I had to learn. And it really helped. I found myself having to do things that I knew I wasn't really good at, but saying, what? okay, I'm the only person around here who's doing this now, and even though it's not perfect, it's better than nobody else is doing it. It's better than nobody doing it at all. And that was enough to keep me going. When he was sick, I had to look after him, and I wasn't especially good at it, but there was nobody else there. So finding myself spending a lot of time working on something that I wasn't automatically good at was very good for me. I learned a lot. So it's important that you come to the meditation not with the idea that you are already going to be good at it. In fact, one of John Fung's strongest terms of criticism was for somebody who thought he was already good before he'd, before he'd even tried it. Ru gon gert, lert gon tam, was his, was his phrase. You know about things before they happen, and you're excellent before you've even tried anything. That attitude, he said, sets you up for a fall. All that's asked is that you realize that you're suffering, and you realize that your actions are the important cause for your suffering, and you're willing to learn. Any attitudes that go beyond that <coughs> set you up for a fall. This is why right view focuses on the issue of suffering. There's no question about making you a better person, simply seeing where there's suffering and seeing where there's a cause of suffering. Because that motivation goes a lot deeper than your self-image. I mean, when you were a little baby, you didn't have a self-image, but you did know that you were suffering, and you're trying to figure out some way to stop it. So try to dig back into that attitude. That was your, that's your face before you were born. And 
that didn't consent, you didn't, you weren't concerned about your face or what it looked like, or what other people would think about what it looked like. There was just that plain old issue of suffering, and you knew that something had to be done about it. Well, here's a here's a path to do something about it. So dig back into that attitude. before your face was born, your face before you were born. And before your face was born. When there was just the issue of suffering and a need to overcome it. When you have that attitude, that's all you really need. And the questions of who you are, or how your performance as a meditator reflects on you, just realize, okay, those are thoughts to put aside. It's not the case that we don't pass judgment on our actions, but don't let that issue become the object of judgment. There's a difference between being judgmental and being judicious. Judgmental is when you're impatient. And you want to come to a decision really fast without putting any effort into finding out what the facts of the case are. That's judgmentalism, and it's, it's harmful. But being judicious is when you look at an action and see, does this action really help put an end to suffering, or does it cause more suffering? You look at the results and then adjust your next action accordingly. That's being judicious, and that's where your powers of evaluation and your the faculty of judgment really are appropriate. But when the issue of your identity or your self-image gets in the way, that's something you want to put aside. And if you, find, if you find it hard to put it aside, don't say, well, this is something really wrong with me, and that gets you into a tailspin. Don't worry about that. Just notice each time it comes and then say, oh, I, I know this one. I know where it goes, and do your best to let it go. That's when you can focus on the issue at hand. Which is the fact that there is suffering, but there is a potential, there's a path to put an end to it. You've got the opportunity to follow that path. And that's all that really matters. <laughs>